Hello, my name is Melissa Vinch, Grants and Contract Specialist here at Stevens Institute of Technology. It is my pleasure to host this webinar featuring one of our top researchers, Dr. Uli. Those of you watching will have received instructions to optimize your computer to enjoy today's program. If you are unable to execute these instructions, your ability to enjoy the program may be impaired. However, the tape program will be available for as much as a year after today via WebEx and also via the Stevens Bay Area website. Dr. Lee's talk will be followed by a live voice question and answer session. During the lecture itself, you will be able to send written questions from your keyboard for Dr. Lee's consideration. A short survey will be emailed to you tomorrow to determine your opinion of today's program and to solicit requests for future webinar topics from Stevens. And now I'm pleased to introduce the Provost and University Vice President, Dr. George P. Corfiatis. Greetings to all of you. Stevens alumni from the Bay Area. As a provost of this great institution, I'm pleased to introduce to you a new experience, uh, this webinar, that will be of uh, great value and impact. Uh, during this uh, webinar uh, that will follow, you will meet our very distinguished professor, Wu Yang Li. He is a professor of chemical engineering and material science who also directs the New Jersey Center for Microchemical Systems. Professor Lee served as the director of the Chemical, Biomedical and Materials Engineering Department from 2001 to 2005. In 2002, Professor Lee founded the Center for Microchemical Systems, which has provided an intellectual platform for more than 20 graduate and postdoctoral students and 20 external collaborators in exploring novel microreactor and microfluidic concepts with several million dollars of funding from a variety of governmental agencies. He has published over 90 referee papers and he received seven U.S. patents. Professor Lee is a fellow of the American Ceramic Society. As you will hear in his presentation, Professor Lee's research is crossing disciplinary boundaries to explore the potential for engineered materials and biochemical processes to heal and protect the human body, both during surgical procedures and following the implantation of biomedical prosthetics and other devices. Thank you for your participation in this exciting new communications venture from Stevens. I look forward to your feedback. It is my uh, great pleasure today to bring our alumni group back to the Hoboken campus uh, for a brief tour of a uh, nanomicrobial research activity at Stevens. As a person who never had a biology course uh, in training, uh, I have begun uh, my bioengineering research uh, about seven years ago. Um, I was uh, profoundly influenced by this New York Times article uh, came out seven years ago. The article basically says uh, one out of ten people in the urban northeast corridor works in the healthcare industry. Obviously, Hoboken is right at the center of this region. Today, uh, the rising cost of healthcare is one of the top national priorities, along with solving uh, financial and energy crisis. At the same time, we have seen the great convergence of a biology and engineering generating transformative ideas and entrepreneurship opportunities with the promise uh, using technology to solve the rising cost of healthcare. Today, I'm gonna use this uh, concept of a tissue engineering on a chip as a uh, technology that can potentially revolutionize the biomedical research uh, community. I'm gonna describe this concept in the context of uh, understanding uh, the wound healing process that occurs on implant surface when we place hip joint like this uh, into our body. If we think that if we can understand this process better and simulate this uh, process of wound healing in vitro, uh, we believe that we can build more predictable infection model of modern uh, biomedical implants where we can study how the infection occurs on the implant surface 
and more importantly, uh, use as a uh, tool to uh, study the efficacy and safety of a potential solutions. I would like to use this uh, tissue model development or tissue engineering application as an entirely new avenue of uh, studying how human tissues respond to drugs, pathogens, and biomaterials, and reducing our sole reliance on animal testing for the biomedical research community. If you have an implant in the human body, uh, it substantially increases risk for infection. For example, without an implant during the wound healing process, it takes about 100 million steboreous cells to cause infection 95% of the time in a guinea pig model. But if you have an implant, it takes only about 100 bacteria cells to cause infection. From a wound healing point of view, also there is a substantial difference whether you have an implant or not during the uh, wound healing process. If you do not have an implant, uh, there is a blood clot formation, we call it provisional matrix formation, immune cells to get there, so as the cells from adjacent healthy tissue to the injured site, forming new uh, cellular matrix, as well as the vasculization takes place, basically capillary formation. With an implant, uh, same process occurs except for the formation of avascular fibrous tissue near the implant surface, about 100 microns thick. So avascular meaning no capillary formation, uh, generating a great diffusion resistance so that we can send antibiotics and immune cell right at the implant surface. Another important phenomena that um, microbiologists have discovered is the formation of a biofilm on the implant man-made surface. Basically, biofilm is something that you see in your bathroom if you don't clean your bathroom uh, often enough. Basically, it's a yellow sticky stuff. Uh, in biofilm, basically, bacteria cells are protected from the biofilm matrix. Basically, you can think of a matrix as a chemical filter which protects the bacteria cells from antibiotics and host defense cells. Um, let me try to scope out the significance of this uh, infection problem uh, for orthopedic implant case. The infection rates uh, range from about a 1% for hip joints, 2% uh, for knees, and higher percentage for open trauma. Uh, step aureus and step epidermidus are predominant bacteria species. And also, we see uh, increasingly the uh, antibiotic strains uh, causing orthopedic device infection, such as MRSA, which we often hear from news media. Because of the biofilm formation and lack of a micro a blood circulation at the implant surface, there is no treatment today uh, when the infection occurs. Uh, standard care is the physical removal of an implant. So imagine your grandmother having a hip joint surgery. In a couple of weeks, infection develops, having to take that implant out again and placing another implant, causing significant patient trauma, along with significant cost. There are about half million hip joint replacements every year, about another half million for knees. So if you do a simple math, cost burden to the healthcare system is about three to four billion dollars a year. Now, there are a lot of wonderful solutions out there, or potential solutions. Uh, we have a nanotechnology-based solution that we've been exploring under the sponsorship of National Science Foundation. We have an interdisciplinary faculty team, along with the three doctoral students working together uh, to uh, come up with this solution. Uh, and Professor Matt Libera, uh, my collaborator, is the lead investigator in this, of this project. Our concept is uh, very simple. Basically, we're going to use these uh, blue nanohydrogel particles to promote the wound healing by having host cells, like a bone cells in this case, osteoblasts, to adhere to the implant surface. But at the same time, we want to design and make these uh, purple nanohydrogel particles uh, to make the implant surface to be responsive to the bacterial cells basically short-circuiting 
the pathway to biofilm formation. Now, we are working on this concept. We're very excited about it. But the real challenge comes after, let's say, we're finding out our uh, solution really works out in the laboratory. But there are going to be some significant translational challenges. Uh, our concept probably today uh, categorized as something that will make orthopedic device less susceptible to infection, mainly for marketing purposes. If we want to get, a, <clears throat> get to the next level as an uh, infection-resistant coating to get FDA and insurance approval, then we're suddenly talking about $300 million development activity, largely due to uh, huge clinical studies that we need to perform because of low infection rates. And perhaps more fundamentally, the uh, disparity between lab data and animal test data, and also uh, ambiguity between animal response and human response. And today, to develop any new drug, it takes about a billion dollars and 10-year period. Uh, since uh, infection is an acute disease, uh, uh, private industry is not investing uh, enough to uh, discover and develop new antibiotics, despite the rapid emergence of uh, antibiotic-resistant strains, uh, clearly a brewing public health crisis. So in order to address these challenges that uh, we've been thinking about, the development of a three-dimensional tissue model as an alternative method to animal testing. Uh, in the framework of our model, uh, as we envision today, uh, we want to have the ability to simulate this formation of a poorly vesicularized tissue between healthy tissue and implant. And if we can develop such a platform, then we can see the effects of having, let's say, drug-eluting coating or antibiotic releasing coating, or human response or defense response, as well as other novel therapeutic agents that we can provide through systematically delivery to the bacteria invasion and pathogenesis of a biofilm. We believe that this kind of model can be much more powerful method of studying the efficacy and safety of new treatment strategies. This is an example of a device that we've been using. Basically, this device is made out of uh, polydimethylsiloxane, PDMS, biocompatible, transparent, elastomeric material. And we put molded, micro-molded uh, PDMS on top of a glass slide. And we use a conventional uh, microelectronics technique to uh, fabricate our devices. And basically, it's a very simple to make and simple to use. We can go from a concept design to working device in about five days. And inside of our uh, micro tissue chamber, uh, we can infiltrate uh, gel, like a collagen gel or fibrin gel. And inside the gel, we place uh, various cells uh, under the under the physiologically relevant flow conditions for long-term cell culture, which lead to formation of functional tissues. This is a, a device in a uh, working mode under the microscope for real-time imaging. Uh, four tissue chambers are running at the same time as a uh, demonstration of uh, high-throughput capability, uh, making it easy to be used by biologists, one of our big aims. Uh, right now, we're focusing on forming a functional tissues, such as bone and soft tissues, uh, with emphasis on how the vesicularization occurs uh, during this tissue formation. This kind of platform, uh, obviously, is not just for wound healing and infection studies, but as well as, as the other diseases. So this is an example of a real-time imaging capability uh, showing uh, osteoblast bone cell development over a 14 days. So from day one to day four, we see a significant proliferation of the cells. From day five to day 12, uh, development of a mature extra extracellular matrix. At day 14, uh, we stain uh, to highlight the areas where calcification occur uh, as evidence of a mineralization. 
Here we are seeing uh, three major characteristics of a cell development, uh, proliferation, uh, extracellular matrix maturation and mineralization, basically showing that we can form a bone-like tissue structure inside of our microchamber. The experiment that we're really excited about right now is to uh, see, generate the evidence uh, uh, for relating the direction of interstitial flow in the human body to the uh, self-organization of uh, cells to form the uh, capillary network, particularly the orientation of their particular network. We're here working with the cancer and endothelial cells, and basically this arrow indicates the direction of a flow, and we see evidence of a, a endothelial cells spreading uh, and elongating along the direction of flow. Initial evidence that showing capillary formation or its orientation of a formation is dependent on the direction of an interstitial flow. This information we're trying to prove is very important in building our tissue model because we believe that this may explain the, uh, the reason for the formation of a vesicular fibrous tissue right at the implant surface. Very important uh, uh, part of our tissue model development. So these simulations show that between, again, healthy tissue site and then coated implant site, there is a provisional matrix with the basically representing the blood clot formation. As the wound healing process occurs, the uh, capillary network on, in the uh, health tissue side will not extend it into the uh, uh, healing wound. Uh, mainly because there is no flow that's normal to the implant surface. But if you remove the implant, basically it reestablishes the, the uh, interstitial flow to go through, and so therefore capillary network can be extended into the region that's being healed. So this is pretty much where we are today. Um, and if we can develop this tissue model, and other investigators at other universities are developing uh, different types of tissue models, such as a liver and lung tissues. And we can imagine that we can actually uh, create human functions on a chip for toxicology study of new drugs. It's really, uh, I think, fascinating uh, research concept. I'd like to wrap up my presentation in the context of uh, why we're doing this at Stevens. In a knowledge-based economy, uh, there is a clear role of a technological university like Stevens. Uh, between industry and university, uh, we are here to uh, generate innovation, solutions to real problem, and providing a new enterprise opportunities. Obviously, there is a regulatory relationship between government and industry. And between university and government, there is a, a responsibility of a new knowledge infrastructure creation. In my mind, uh, building or developing in vitro tissue models belongs to the category of a new knowledge infrastructure creation, whereas our nanotechnology-based coding solutions to fight infection probably resides in the innovation category. This uh, concept for technological university's role is not uh, new. Uh, we have actually practiced since our foundational days. Let me introduce uh, Professor Robert Thurston, uh, first professor of mechanical engineering at Stevens, first president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineering, profilic writer. He founded the Mechanical Laboratory. At the time, there was a great convergence between metallurgy and engineering, just like we have today between biology and engineering. His laboratory developed alloy test methods to solve steam engine boiler explosion problem, which was the, uh, the uh, big problem at that time, especially for ocean liners going between Europe and America. Uh, his work led to various inventions and providing uh, entrepreneurship opportunities for his students as well as his colleagues. To a large extent, uh, this nanomicrobioactivity that, that I'm describing to you is a, a small part of our faculty today at Stevens to follow the legacy of Professor Thurston's 
uh, uh, accomplishments. I would like to use this picture of uh, Augusta National Golf Club as a, um, uh, a metaphor to remind ourselves it takes an uh, entire community, large community, to uh, nurture uh, a, a vibrant theater where individuals can pursue excellence. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, collaborators, Professor Matt Libera in material science, Professor Hong Jung Wang in biomedical engineering. We have shared a lot of great ideas as well as challenges in our laboratories. Uh, Helen Lee, my PhD student in material science, has been able to integrate a lot of difficult experimental work in various laboratories and able to generate the results that I have shown you today. I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to great follow-up discussion. Thank you.